Welcome back to week five. In this segment, we will review the role of internet intermediaries on the realization and protection of freedom of expression. I will first define what I mean by intermediaries, and then I will illustrate their role in the online world and in particular in the realization of freedom of expression. We will seek to answer one central question. How responsible are intermediaries for online content produced or posted by others? So let's begin first by a definition. The term intermediaries in the online world is being used to refer to the very different entities that are providing services enabling the delivery of online content to the users. One may distinguish between several of those entities and people are distinguishing various entities. I will just offer here a fairly simple one. First, we have the Internet Service Providers or ISP. They are those who provide access to Internet via DSL cable modem, wireless, or dedicated high-speed interconnect. Examples of the largest ISPs include China Telecom, which is a Chinese company, Comcast, a US company, or Airtel, an Indian company. Second, we have the so-called web hosting providers, or host, also refers to as cash. These are the companies that rent web server space to enable their customers to set up their own website. Thirdly, we have social media platform, blogging platform, trading platform. These are platforms which are used to exchange information and viewpoint, sell or buy product. Examples of such platforms include Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, blog post, eBay. And, and so on. A distinctive feature of social media platforms is that they encourage individuals to connect and interact with each other and to share content. And then we have search engine, the fourth category, such as Google or Bing. They are programs and algorithms that search database and internet site for documents containing keywords specified by users. They allow users to search the World Wide Web for specific information, which is then organized, ordered, indexed, and presented to the user as a series of hyperlinks. Each of these intermediaries may be further subdivided into various other kind of intermediaries. And in fact, a range of companies, a range of intermediaries offer different services that cut across those various services. So the notion of intermediaries is one that is very flexible, very open. From a freedom of expression standpoint, each of these intermediaries or entities has a direct influence and impact on the ability of individuals to exercise their right to freedom of expression and information. This is not necessarily a new phenomenon. The telephone company, for instance, private or state-owned, allowed people to communicate and impart information. Clearly though, as I have indicated throughout the lesson, a new information era has been unleashed by Internet and the information technology. And the various actors associated with its integration in all aspects of social, political and economic life are very new in the history of uh, humankind and human society. The ubiquitous nature of internet, particularly but not only with regard to the realization of freedom of expression, raises two key questions as far as these intermediaries are concerned. First, do intermediaries have specific responsibilities as far as free speech is concerned? We have so far largely focused on the role of the state in protecting, respecting, and fulfilling freedom of expression. Indeed, the entire human rights system 
is predicated on the central role of the state. But what about the online world where non-state actors play such a central function? Do they inherit the same responsibilities as the state? Should they also be protecting and respecting freedom of expression? That question is the object of a short supplementary video, which I will invite you uh, to review. But in a nutshell, the response is yes. They have responsibilities, including to protect freedom of expression and certainly to respect it. The second question concerns the relationship of these intermediaries with the content that is circulating online, content that you or I may have produced, shared, imported. Of course, we remain ultimately responsible for the nature of this content. But do the intermediaries also have responsibility for that content? Can it be said that because of their function, they also produce or publish it alongside the first speaker, you or me. That question is at the heart of many current dilemma, debates, legal and political dispute regarding online freedom of expression. Let me illustrate this with some example. Groups involved in so-called terrorism are using social media, including Twitter or YouTube, to circulate information about their violent activities. It has also been argued that they use the online world to recruit fighters and, and uh, sympathizers. Similarly, violent hate groups use social media to propagate their hatred. The question is whether these social media are responsible for the circulation of this hateful content do they also have a responsibility for that content? Are they liable for the content being produced by others? And if so, how liable are they? What about copyrights or privacy online? If I post or access a song, a video, a book, a movie, for which I have no copyright, I am breaking the law. But what about the sites where I have posted this product, such as YouTube, are they also breaking the law? In contrast to the usual free expression system that we have explored in the previous week, the internet is not dyadic, meaning it is not just about one speaker and one listener, but it involves a range of intermediaries between that speaker and that listener. There are a lot of actors who are going to play specific functions in the technologically complex environment that is internet. And without all of those actors, the amazing potentials of internet, as far as information and expression are concerned, could not be realized. That's for sure. But do they also have responsibility for the content produced by this speaker and received by this listener. Increasingly, governments around the world have insisted that intermediaries bear some degree of responsibility for the content that is posted or circulated through their various services. For instance, many governments request that intermediaries monitor, filter, or block content that they consider break the law. Failure to do so exposes the intermediaries to legal consequences, which may include large financial fines. That is a so-called liability regime of intermediaries. In the remaining of this segment, I will navigate you through the jungle that constitutes the intermediary liability regime or system around the world. To paraphrase a recent article, referring to it as a jungle. I will then highlight what this regime means in terms of freedom of expression in the next segment. But first, let's focus on that key word, liability. You must have heard it before, but what does it mean exactly? Basically, liability means legal responsibility. 
you are liable for something means you are legally responsible for it. Around the world, there has been roughly speaking three different forms of liability for intermediaries. Although, as we shall see, those archetypes are challenged and there are a number of subcategories. First, we have the strict liability model under which internet intermediaries are liable for content produced by others. That's the so-called third-party content. This model is the one used, for instance, in Thailand and China. And in effect, intermediaries are required to monitor all of the content that circulate through their services in order to comply with the law. If they fail to do so, they are completely and utterly responsible, liable for the content produced by others. And they may face a number of sanctions, including the withdrawal of their business license and indeed criminal penalties. Such a model of liability is imposed on all kinds of inter intermediaries, including the least active one as far as uh, content is concerned, such as ISPs. In essence, it also means that intermediaries are basically treated as publishers, responsible for the content published and produced by others. Let me give you one example. The China Tort Liability Law of 2010, which includes an internet clause that specify that, in this case, an internet service provider shall bear joint liability with the internet user when it knew, I'm insisting on that, when it knew that the internet user was conducting an illegal activity by using its internet service, but failed to take any necessary measure. So the China Internet Law Clause establish a knowledge standard or test, that's a when it knew, which is a highly disputed area of law in China and, and elsewhere. What does that mean, when it knew? What is required for them to know? Does it require a complete and full monitoring of all content or just a partial one? It is clear that under this approach, the ISP has to engage into some kind of content monitoring to be protected from liability. And many of them, in fact, engage in full content monitoring because they can't afford to be found guilty and liable. So that's one extreme form of liability for intermediaries. They are basically more or less liable for everything that is being circulated through their services. At the other hand of the spectrum, we find something called the broad immunity model, which basically grants internet intermediaries broad or possibly conditional immunity from liability for content produced by others. And it exempts them from any kind of general requirement to monitor the content. Under this model, intermediaries are not publishers. They may be treated as messengers who are not responsible for the content they carry. A little bit like the post office is responsible not for the content of um, your letter, but is responsible for ensuring the letter's goes to its destination. Such a model can be found principally in the United States, in Singapore, and in some part of the EU regulatory regime. But uh, the, the US is the best model, really, for that broad immunity uh, regime. The US Communication Decency Act states for instance, that no provider or user of an interactive computer service shall be treated as the publisher or speaker of any information provided by somebody else. So that's fairly clear. There is basically very little or no uh, liability at all under that regime. And then we have 
the, the, the middle ground uh, in between these two extremes uh, stand the most common liability regime. It is a so-called safe harbor model which grants intermediaries immunity from liability provided they act quickly, expeditiously to remove or disable access to illegal information when they obtain actual knowledge of such content. This model is at the heart of the so-called notice and takedown procedures, meaning that upon notification and hopefully investigation, the intermediaries must take appropriate steps, which may include taking down the content that has been flagged to their attention as being illegal. The safe harbor model usually applies to the most active of all intermediaries as far as content is concerned, those that have direct interaction with the content in the first place, social media platform. For instance, uh, the e-commerce directive of the European Union hold that a hosting provider is not liable for the information stored provided that A, the provider does not have actual knowledge of the illegal nature of the activity or information, and B, the provider, upon obtaining such knowledge or awareness, act expeditiously to remove or to disable access to the information. India, too, has adopted a safe harbor system which is slightly different from the European one, under the Information Technology Act, an internet intermediary, including telecom service providers, network service providers, ISP, web hosting, all of them may be immune from liability, provided they too, again, uh, meet the conditions uh, under the law. No person providing any service shall be liable for any third-party information if he can prove that the offence or contravention was committed without his knowledge or that he had exercised all due diligence to prevent the commission of such offence. And you recall that when I was uh, speaking about the strict liability um, uh, system, I mentioned the knowledge standard in uh, the China tort law, but as you can see, the concept of knowledge, knowing uh, whether or not the content is illegal or not, that uh, con concept goes for the two forms, indeed the third as well forms of, of regimes. And that's why it is at the heart of many debate. What exactly does that mean to be knowledgeable? and what kind of measures are intermediaries supposed to take in order to avoid liability. So these were, in a nutshell, the theoretical models for liability around the world. In practice, one may find a mixture of these models in the same country. For instance, China also includes a notice and take down liability approach alongside the strict liability. Okay, it's a possibly it's a moot point, but still. Europe has devised two, possibly three different legal regime as far as intermediaries are concerned, depending on the nature of the issue, copyright, data protection, right to privacy, the nature of the intermediaries, passive or mere messengers versus active or publishers. And in addition, at national level, courts in Europe have interpreted the liability regime set up by various European directives in vastly different fashion. In a, a recent uh, court decision at regional level by the European Court for Human Rights in Delphi versus Estonia, the European Court held that Delphi, one of the largest internet portals in Estonia, was in a position to know about an article to be published, to predict the nature of the possible comments, 
and to take technical or manual measures to prevent defamatory statement from being made public. That um, decision created huge shockwaves throughout the intermediary community and indeed the free speech community because the European Court agreed with the Estonian government that Delphi mechanisms to address libelous and possibly hateful comments were insufficient, even though Delphi had a notice and take down system. So it just suggested that Delphi should prevent defamatory and clearly unlawful statements from being published on the website. That, in essence, equates Delphi with a media, with a newspaper, with um, a, a strict liability regime. The USA, which tend to be the most consistent of all in its approach to online regulation, also uh, include uh, a different form of liability beside the non-liability uh, regime. It's a safe harbor clause in the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which is, of course, limited to copyright infringement, but nevertheless is bringing a different form of liability depending on the content um, and the nature of the right that may be violated, in this case, copyright. Add to all of these an evolving and forever changing case law, and what you have is a maze and a jungle all at once. To sum up, I have introduced in this segment the role of internet intermediaries. I have focused on the various forms of legal responsibility that these intermediaries hold over content produced by their users, the so-called liability regime, and highlighted a diverse, if not confusing, global system. In the next segment, I will focus on the implication that these regimes have for the protection of freedom of expression online. Thank you.